um, the rules that we use or the guidelines that we use are, are definitely not foreign to you. Uh, we view and interpret the latest model fields and then we re review the latest model tracks to see how the models have been um, verifying over time. And we consider the previous forecast continuity is a very heavy constraint that we use. And that and along with the persistence, at least within the first 12 to 24 hours. Uh, changes in direction and speed along an individual forecast track are also made very gradually and we oftentimes uh, lag what, uh, what is going on. And we do this because uh, we want to make sure that we're making the right decision. And the track forecast guidance, um, of course, has the greatest skill. When it comes to intensity guidance, it's a lot less skillful. I'll show you some examples of that. But this is just another summary slide for our considerations. Continuity, uh, the previous forecast does, is, is a heavy constraint. Um, if we start moving the track around, we call this the windshield wiper effect, uh, then we lose credibility and, act, and the skill actually goes down. We know this because uh, we've done this in the past. Um, and so the changes to the forecast are made in very, very small increments over time. Um, as I mentioned, persistence, at least during the first 12 to 24 hours, the forecast is, is heavily used. And uh, there is no model of the day that we follow exactly, but uh, we've become uh, very fond of using what is known as a model consensus, uh, using um, an averaging of all the, all the guidance models. And to the extent that they're independent of one another, the model consensus is usually uh, what wins the day. And so we, we usually go very close to the model consensus. Uh, if we don't, then we have to really have a good reason for, for deviating from it. And of course, what goes in this is assessing the large scale environment. And to do that, we're looking at satellite observations uh, to identify the main steering influences. So this is an example of the type of track guidance uh, that we use. Very simply, or the, the most simple of them, persistence and extrapolation. The Clipper model, which is really not used anymore, but we do use this to uh, to gauge how skillful the other models are. It's sort of like a benchmark uh, to, to gauge how skillful um, the dynamical models are. The beta and infection models, the BAM models, those are very simple barotrophic models. Uh, they're layer averages. Uh, there's a shallow one, a medium one, and a deep one. But the ones that we use more often than not are the dynamical models. Many of these you're very familiar with, the GFS, the NOGAS, the UKMET, and the more regionalized model. And to, uh, I didn't have the European on here, but the European also. And uh, the more regional models, which are centered over the storm, the GFDL, and now the h -Wharf. Um But more than anything, we do rely on these consensus and ensembles. We look at the GFS ensemble mean. Uh, the GUNA consensus has been replaced with what's called uh, TVCON. And uh, we have a, a number of other uh, consensus type um, uh, guidance. Um, they're either selected a consensus or weighted consensus, and we have the FSU Super Ensemble. Todd, sorry to interrupt again. I remember one of your guys saying once that the NAM was basically worthless in tropical weather. Is that the case? <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to be very careful about what I say. <laughs> um, we generally do not use uh, the NAM in operations uh, at the Hurricane Center. That is not to say that we, we don't look at it, um, but um, there are quite a, quite a few severe problems with it. Um, I, think it. I think it says something that we actually use the Canadian and, and not the NAM. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I should mention that um, the Canadians have made uh, quite a valiant effort here recently to improve their model. And uh, we notice that there are fewer false alarms, and it's, it's doing a lot better. So whatever they've done, I think they did something to the radiation code. Um, it's producing fewer storms, and the track guidance seems to be much more in line with what we're seeing from some of the other models. Um, this is an example, by the way, of, of, um, of the skill associated with using the, a, a model consensus, in this case, GUNA. We have a, a new acronym for that now. But we have the four models, uh, the NOGAPs, UK MET, uh, GFDL, and I think this is the GFS. And uh, <coughs> notice where the track verified. That's where we, we forecast the center to be. And even though they're all kind of around there, when we average them together, <coughs> uh, the consensus is a really good way to go. So this is an excellent ex example of how skillful the con consensus can be and why we've relied on it so heavily. Yep, there's where Isabel was. But here's a case where 
Uh, Jack Bevan likes to refer to this as the spider, or the squash spider uh, forecast. You know that this is with Hurricane Kate in 2003, the track going up this way, and we have four different solutions. They're all over the place. And where did we say that the storm was going to be? Well, that's where the model consensus was. That's where we went. We didn't move it very quickly at all. Well, where did it verify? Right over there. So that's an example where the, uh, the model consensus didn't quite work out the way we had anticipated. And in general, although we do a very good job, especially when we rely on the model consensus, uh, even small deviations from the forecast track can have a dramatic effect. I think many of you remember the forecast track associated with Charlie and the news media and others. They generally saw the track going up to Tampa and they didn't. E even though Port Charlotte was in the hurricane warning area, um, look at where most of the guidance was. It was there and to the west. So um, it was it ch Charlie basically remains on track. Unfortunately, there's something of a quandary with the latest guidance, the new GFD. I mean, th if anything, the, the guidance right before landfall trended west. Um, so, uh, but in this case, um, and, and I, I'm sure the model consensus was right up the middle here somewhere. So, uh, and this is 24 hours before landfall, so you would think that the model guidance would be a little more behaved. Uh, and I, actually, I would say that I would characterize it as fairly well behaved, but you notice that the track uh, verified a little to the right and had a tremendous impact there. And there's the, four, the verifying track. So, and what I wanted to show you here very quickly, let me go back. Yeah, there we go. There's a series of forecasts and the associated guidance uh, during Hurricane Ike. Um, and I want you to see how the model guidance, this is the model guidance that we had in real time. I want you to see how it flip flops. It goes all over the place. Um, and Generally, if we follow our philosophy of not making very radical changes and making changes over small increments, how that, how that pays off in the end. So in this case, the storm is located over eastern Cuba at this point. And you think that the, uh, uh, the track guidance is, is fairly well behaved. It's showing a general west to west northwest track. And if anything, the track bends a little more to the left at the very end because the guidance models are suggesting that a ridge to the north, which will be temporarily interrupted by a passing short wave, is going to rebuild at the end. And guess what? During the next cycle, the model guidance initially is west-northwest, but you notice that as the ridge is forecast to build in, uh, the tracks uh, are even more to the left. And <clears throat> only two models at this point, the GFD on the H wharf, are farther to the, uh, they're on the right-hand side of the guidance envelope, and they're su suggesting some sort of northward turn at the very end. Now the GFDL and HWARF are regional models, so typically if there's a shortwave feature that's way upstream, they don't do well um, with that, so they, their, their skill actually degrades with time. So that's one of the reasons why the forecast track was adjusted southward in this case. As we go forward another cycle, you notice that there's a dichotomy in the tracks. We have at least two or three models which are saying the tra uh, track is going to be farther up near Houston where it verified, or, but many more actually to the south, and uh, at this point, uh, because uh, the consensus moves south, our track moves south. Next cycle, still a very large spread in the guidance. If anything, the spread is even larger uh, because of the UK map being so far right. And the Hurricane Center track uh, is leading at this point toward the European solution. Uh, so if anything, there might, we might have shifted it ever so slightly to the right. But in general, uh, the track is south of where it needs to be at this point. Oh, I went one too far. And look at this, it was during this, this next cycle that the spread of the guidance models uh, really narrows and the track is adjusted northward because of this. And very few models are insisting on a, a straight westward track into southern Texas like they were previously. Um, and at least for the next few cycles, guess what? The model guidance generally is saying the same thing and it's beginning to converge on one particular s solution which is along the upper Texas coast. So the track is continually nudged northward from cycle to cycle until uh, the storm makes landfall.